hello folks this is evening and um, of the 9th of June and I wanted to refer to a video that came out yesterday a number of people have sent it to me by Yasser Qadi Yasser Qadi who is Sheikh Dr. Yasser Qadi uh, he is well known on internet on YouTube he has his own YouTube channel uh, known as Yasser Qadi you just go right up put his name in there about 336,000 subscribers. But um, he, he graduated with a BSc in chemical engineering from the University of Houston. So he's from Houston. Uh, and then there he was accepted as a student at the Islamic University of Medina, that's in uh, Arabia. After completing a diploma in Arabic, he graduated with a BA from the College of Hadith and Islamic Studies, Sciences, and completed an MA in Islamic Theology from the College of Dahwa. From there, then he came back to the States and he went to did an MA, a MPhil, and a PhD from Yale University. And he talks about this in this video here, uh, what happened there. Now, the topic of his doctoral dissertation was reconciling reason and revelation in the writings of Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah from the 1300s, well known as the radical scholar that really defined Islam, uh, that any good Muslim has to go back to the Quran modeled by Muhammad. Sheikh Yasser is currently the Dean of the Islamic Seminary of America and uh, as such he then he currently is resident also scholar of the East Plano uh, Islamic Center where he resides with his wife and four children. Now he is probably one of the most respected Muslim scholars on the right, not on the left but on the right uh, and has been very clear of his allegiance to a perfect unfettered Quran has always been that way, much like Shabir Ali that we talked about last week. But he's in an interview yesterday, yesterday uh, the 8th, uh, with Muhammad Hijab. Muhammad Hijab is also on the internet. He just put Muhammad Hijab, you go right to his site. He has about 227,000 uh, subscribers, so very popular. And he is concerned about some things that Yasif, Yasif Qadi has said earlier on, a few years ago, concerning the... Um, uh, uh, ISIS and a few things there and there have most of the video is about an hour and 45 minutes long don't watch the whole I'll put it in I'll put it up in the description box where you can go see this video but it's when you get further into the video especially in this it's really a interview in uh, on Muhammad Hijab site it's controversial questions it's what if it refers to controversial questions answered by uh, Sheikh Qadi. In his site, it's on the hot seat. On Yasser Qadi's site, he puts it on the hot seat. Fascinating how they look at it from two different perspectives. But once you get into about an hour and 17 minutes is where it really begins. That's where the question first comes up. And it's by Muhammad Hijab on his view concerning the preservation of the Quran. What are you saying about the preservation of the Quran? And up to that time, there's been all this controversy about these new converts to Islam and how they misappropriated and they have gone too far and they've become too conservative in their viewpoint. And so, Muhammad Hijab is asking this question, well, yes, this is a concern for us as well. Where do you stand on this preservation of the Quran? And especially, where do you stand on Ahruf and Giraat? And for those who are uninitiated, we're talking about the dots and the vowels that are put into added to the Arabic in the 8th and 9th century and by the 9th and 10th century then you have many different schools of Ahruf and Kirat. Next week I'm getting a book that has 10 of these Ahruf and Kirat with other t two students for each one of the 10. So we're talking about 30 of these different Ahruf and Kirat that they have just been published, just came out uh, about a month or two ago that I'm going I'm now receiving and I'm going to unpack it for you in a video probably next week or the week after. But certainly it's this question. I'm just going to play you what he said because it's fascinating what he said on one hour in the 21st minute. So let's just go through and hear what he said there. I want to go to another thing which is probably the most, when I put on the community page, the most asked thing which is that you're involved in about preservation of Quran. Okay. And since you were very candid on, on the points before uh, with the madakhila and things, I want, we want you to be very candid in terms of uh, your, your, your position here. I mean, uh, what is your position in relation to preservation of Quran? Is, for example, Hafsa and Asim, the way Hafsa and Asim, do you see it as preserved munazzal from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or do you not see that as munazzal? What's your Jay position? 
Jayid. Okay, so uh, first and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna nahnu nazal dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidun. So we yeah. believe as a matter of theology, as a matter of aqeed, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved the Quran, no question about it. Now, number of points. Yeah. To ask for the issue itself, every single student of knowledge knows who studies ulum al-Quran that the most difficult topics are ahruf and qiraat and the concept of ahruf and the reality of ahruf and the relationship of the Rathmanic Mus'haf with the Ahruf and the preservation of the Ahruf. Is it one? Is it three? Is it seven? And the relationship of the Qira'at to the Ahruf. This is a topic that when you're the beginning, beginning student of knowledge, you're like, what is all of this going on here? When you go a little bit more, you learn to simply memorize what your teachers say and regurgitate it out. And you don't fully comprehend. When you do a deep dive is when things get very, very awkward and difficult. And this is... So here, it's fascinating, you've watched this now, uh, here is Yasakadi, who is talking about this problem of Ahruf and Kirat. The most difficult subject is, are these two categories, Ahruf and Kirat. He's going to go on and say later on about the crisis he had over this. But what's fascinating for him to admit this, now you have to give him credit for this, the fact that he's admitting this, the fact that he is on camera, the fact that he did this yesterday, you know, kudos to him for admitting this in public. It gets better, though, and it gets deeper. Because what did he say? In order to understand this about Ahruf Kirat, you've got to dive deep. You, you can't just come to this easily. You can't, and this is going to be a, a, uh, a theme that he brings up over and over again throughout this 20 minutes. It's about 20 minutes long, uh, the, uh, this part of the interview referred to uh, state on this one subject about the preservation of the Quran. So let's see what he says next, because this was a crisis for him. Note. And this isn't new. This is from the time of the Sahaba. In the Sahih or the Hassan Hadith of Ubay bin Ka'b, the Hadith of the Ahruf, that when the Prophet mentioned the issue of Ahruf and that there are different Ahruf and whatnot, this is in the version of Muslim Imam Ahmad, Ubay bin Ka'b says, authentic Hadith, فَدَخَلَ فِي نَفْسِي شَكْ In my heart, a doubt came that I hadn't had about Islam since the days of Jahiliyyah. This is not a joke, brothers and sisters. The issue of Ahruf and Qira'at caused confusion to somebody whom the Prophet ﷺ said, if you want to listen to the Qur'an directly, listen to Ubay. Ubay is not some even average Sahabi. He is the Qari of the Qur'an. He is the master. He is who he is. And he goes, فَدَخَلَ فِي نَفْسِي شَكْ what is all of this stuff? And the process and the prophet, put, it, yeah. put his hand and then he goes, ha, it all went away. Yeah, me and you, yeah. we don't have that blessing, do we? Me and you don't have that blessing. Now, um, again, this is the, you, you have asked me some very honest question. It's the first time I'm saying these things. Many people are aware who listen to my lectures that I've mentioned the crises that happened to me at Yale. My first year at okay. Yale. It wasn't a crisis of faith, by the way. So I was very clear about this. People misinterpreted. It was a crisis of my understanding of knowledge. It was a crisis of what my teachers taught me. Alhamdulillah, from alhamdulillah, as somebody who memorized the Quran as a teenager, alhamdulillah, in my entire life, I have never doubted that the Quran is divine. You cannot doubt that. Any, you listen to it, you recite it, you just cannot doubt that. It's never been an issue. Now, for the first time, I'm telling you here, what was the crisis? I mentioned it, referenced it, but I never explicitly said it. Why didn't I say it? because it should not be said in public. But unfortunately, these brothers, because they released the emails, so then I have to then get, get it. This was the issue. That... Are you picking that up? Did you get that? The crisis was never that he doubted the Quran, because he had, since as a little boy, he's memorized it, he had to recite it, he had to go over it over and again as a young lad. So that's not the crisis. The crisis was living and going to Yale University and hearing questions about, really, preservation of the Quran. But he was very clear to say, it's not the Ahruf and Kirat, that's not what called the crisis, it were the questions, the doubt that came in. But thank God that I had been brought up as a good Muslim and I did not submit to or uh, get overwhelmed by that crisis because I had known, I knew that rote memory, that I've been always been told, the Quran is the word of God. Fascinating. We'll come back to that. Let's go on. The issue of ahruf and preservation and qiraat and relationships between them, these are very, very difficult issues. And the most advanced of our scholars 
they're not quite fully certain how to solve all of the unanswered yeah. questions in there. Ibn al-Jazari, who without a doubt is the greatest scholar of Qiraat for the last thousand years. Ibn al-Jazari yeah. famously writes, I have been thinking and pondering, oh yes, I've been thinking and pondering about the issue of the Ahruf and Qiraat for over 35 years. Nathan with Latina Sana, he said, right? And yeah. confused and whatnot, then finally, this is my response. And by, the way, seven, and by the way, or, even that yeah. seven, all later scholars say, well, that doesn't make any sense. So they kind of dismissed even that. After 35 years, the greatest scholar of so, Qiraat. Some, some accepted you know, it. Some accepted it. It some, doesn't answer I've the seen, question. Yeah. Some, anyway, I don't want to get yeah. into that issue. Okay, fine. Why do I not want to get to that issue? Here's the point. So, did you catch that? This is a problem, the ahruf in the kira'at, these problems with the dots, the problems with the vowels that have been added at a much later date. That's a real problem because which of these dots and which of these different uh, different combinations of dots is the one that is the Word of God? Because there's only one Quran. So how can you have more than one different derivation? Which Quran, which of these, now we're up to 30, uh, Hatun has been able to find 37 which of these? And he says, the most advanced of our scholars are not certain how to solve this issue. What an admission. That's huge for Yasser Qadi to say that. And he talks about Ibn al-Jazari, who is considered one of the greatest, the highest of the highest. For the last thousand years, he is the one that's always quoted on the Kira. This is his area of expertise. And after 35 years of studying this, was just dismissed because he could, didn't even have the answer that Muslims need today. Huge admission. Now we get into something even better. Listen to what he says next. Let's go ahead and hear it. These issues should only be discussed amongst people mm. who know what the Qira'at right. are and who understand yeah. some of these questions that are being so, so raised. So is what you're saying, the shek that came, or not the shek, but the, the crisis that you had was in relation to this question of the relationship between the Ahruf and the Qira'at, basically? No, 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 the crisis I had wasn't that. The crisis I had was, well, yeah, wait, that, that, that was what generated. But what was the crisis? The crisis was very simple. And by the way, this is now a well-known open secret amongst many Muslim graduate students and, and, and academics around the world. And yeah. this is well-known. Traditional understandings of Ahruf and Qira'at cannot answer some of these pressing questions that are now being poked by our uh, people outside of, by our academics, not our, by their academics outside of the faith tradition. You see, in a Muslim environment, there's always some respect that we have for the Quran. We should. In a Muslim environment, we'll press a little bit and then we'll say, okay, khalas, sami'na wa ata'na. And that's great, alhamdulillah. When you go to academia, they don't have that red line. And they're going to just, you know, the, 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 the famous story of the emperor with no clothes. They're going to just point out, no, that doesn't make any sense. Well, that's not true. And this and that. And they'll bring issues, which I'm not going to mention explicitly, that you know are true because they're in your own books. They're not inventing anything new. They'll bring you riwayat and they'll bring you athar. And then you add to that very well-known issues of, I don't even want to be explicit. And then you bring on top of that makhtutat. And then and then. And wow. So... This should only be discussed amongst knowledgeable people, not new converts, and certainly not people who are not Muslims. This is something for those who go deep, he said. He. The, why? Because traditional understanding of the Ahruf and Kirat cannot answer these pressing questions being posed by Western academics. Western academics. Western academics. Fascinating. And so that's why he had this crisis in Yale University. He's admitting it was a crisis for me because they were asking questions that I could not answer and that the traditional understanding has no answers for this. The, all the scholars that have gone ahead have no answer. But did he just say that this should be not something that we should discuss, that this is, you have to go deep into it? Well, who has gone deep into it if it has not been the traditional scholars? Men like even al Jazari, who's who has studied this for 35 years. So in, can you see the contradictions coming up here? No one who is who are new to the faith should be even getting into this. What, but yet we are up to a crisis right now because for a thousand years we haven't answered this question. Now Western scholars, they're much more knowledgeable now, and now they're using criteria that they won't accept that you have seven or 14 or three or 30 different readings, and yet this is one Quran. They're not going to accept that anymore. 
academics don't respect the Quran like we do. See, we know there's a red line. You don't go beyond it. If there's a crisis that you come up like he had in Yale, you just say, oh, I just fall back on what I've known from my childhood. I knew it's from God. This is God's word. I don't question it. I don't go beyond that red line. But the Western scholars aren't going to do that. They are going beyond the red line. We are going beyond the red line. What do you think we've been doing? At least I've been doing this for six years when I confronted Shabir Ali with this. What do you think we did back in 2016 when Hutton and I held up those 26 Qurans at that time? Who was in the crowd right there when we were holding up those 26 Qurans? Muhammad Hijab was in that crowd. You can see him. He's calling everybody to fall. Look at the video. We'll show it again later on. Look at the video of what he does. He has to call everybody to leave. Peck, I'm just going to show it right now. Look at the video right here. Look at it. There is only one Quran, right? And that every Quran in the world is the same. That's what you've been told. You have been told a lie. You run away from truth. Okay, so there are two Qurans today, right? Two. More than two, friends. More than two, three Qurans. More than three, four Qurans. There are approximately 26 of the Qurans. and see these 26 Qurans. And this is what Yusuf Qadhi is saying. Now, here is Muhammad Hijam. We're now in 2020, and he wants him to answer this question because he's had a crisis of faith. Muhammad Hijab is having a crisis of faith since 2016, I'm sure. That's why he wants this question answered. See, academics don't have that red line. They will answer. Everything is open up for grabs. Any question is permitted when you're in the West. That's the beauty of Western education. They'll bring issues which you know are true, he said this, because they're in our own books, so they're actually repeating the things that we've already known about, that there are many different kid'ats. And he talked about Ruwait, the time, and he says, I, and then he suddenly stopped and realized, I don't want to give any more fodder to those who are listening, so I don't want to be explicit. And he quickly stopped, shut down. I would love to know what were the other things that he thought that were so damaging for the Western scholars. It's very clear to you and to every single very advanced student and specialist that the standard narrative has holes in it. That's what I'm going to say. The standard narrative does not answer some very pressing questions. Okay. This is what I'm going to say. say. And but I, I think here, we wait, 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 let, let me finish this Samuel, because this yeah, is a very important yeah, point. Yeah. I'll let you kind of, let Fine. me finish this. And by the way, if you are yeah. following online media and articles and whatnot, this is no longer hidden news. More and more professors and academics are writing stuff and it's being publicized on Twitter in the last two, three yeah. years. I have had at least, I'd say, a dozen people tweet at me like specific articles like, how do you answer this? And, you know, about Ulum al-Quran, about Qiraat, about Makhtutat, about issues, you know. These are now well known within the Western Academy uh, that they're bringing forth issues. Their level of now knowledge is leaps and bounds above what it used to be, you know, 100 years ago. You know? Ooh, and whoa, what an admission. The standard narrative, the traditional account that we've had, that I've grown up with, the one that has helped me and preserved me while I was in Yale, it has holes in it. So he's admitting it. That's an enormous admission right there. Has holes and cannot answer some very pressing questions. You have to give, uh, you have to give uh, 
uh, Qadi an awful lot of commendation here. He is saying what no Muslim wants to hear. Did you notice how many times Muhammad Hijab tried to jump in and try to stop him from saying that? And tried to, well, no, no, not, that's not really the case. You could see he got shut down. Qadi says, no, let me finish, let me finish, let me finish. And then he says, Western level of knowledge is leaps and bounds above what it used to be. They've come full circle. We now are not able. Let's see what he says next. By and large, our ulama in the Eastern world are not aware, by and large, of what's going on in the Western side of things. And they're not answering those questions in a manner that it needs to be answered. And this is something all of us that are in academia fully acknowledge. Wow. I mean, by and large, our Eastern ulema scholars, that's the best that Islam can offer today, are not aware of what's going on in the Western side of things. And he is speaking from the West. He lives in the West. He lives in Houston. He also travels all over the United States and the world. And he is up against this because he got hit with it at Yale University. Muhammad Hijab got hit with it there at Speaker's Corner and has continued to get hit with it because he still goes down to Speaker's Corner. Look at his videos. He's been down there even this last week. He is there in London and he's getting hit with it. And young men like Muhammad Hijab want an answer. They really want an answer from Yusuf Qadir. They want to be told, this is okay, don't worry about it, it's all right. So he continues on. This issue uh, of Ahruf and Qiraat has troubled the Ummah from the very beginning of time. It's nothing new. And there are 15 opinions about this. None of them fully answer all of the questions that are raised. Some of them answer more than others. So the Issues of the relationship, of the origins, of the ikhtilaf and all of this should only be discussed amongst those who are familiar with this science. And if you want to. This issue of Qira'at has troubled the Muslim scholars from the very beginning. There are 15 opinions about this, but none of them answers fully the question that are raised. So the issue of Ahruf in Qira'at should only be discussed amongst those who are familiar with this science. Who are you to to to? Did he just get done saying that they don't they don't have an answer to it? Did he just get done saying uh, about four minutes earlier that uh, Ibn al Jasri, who spent thirty five years on it, considered to be the best scholar in the last thousand years, is not accepted because his his answers are not that. And now he's saying that this must be only uh, discussed. This must be only discussed amongst scholarly circles. Well, look at what the scholars have done with it. This is a contradiction in term. He's going both ways on this, and you can see why, because he's being put back into a corner. I can't answer this question in a 20-minute interview, nor is yeah, it okay, wise okay. to do so, which is why I never brought this topic up myself. You will not find one lecture of mine about this issue. It should never be brought up in public. And I don't like these idiots, and they are idiots, wallahi, because they're the ones who caused this. In this issue, they're utter idiots who did something haram. And I don't like saying this. This is not something you discuss amongst the masses, ya It's not wise. You don't understand qiraat. Let it be. It's wise. That's why I never did it. And that's why even when they accused me, I didn't defend myself because I would rather people have doubt about me than the Quran. Let them throw me off the manhaj, no problem. Believe in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It cannot answer this question in a 20-minute interview. That's understandable. I understand that. Thus, I have never brought this, brought this topic up myself. You will not find one lecture of mine about this issue. It should never be brought up in public. Wow, what an admission. What an admission. So... It's obvious to him that he wants this to be only within Muslim circles and only amongst the ulama, the religious scholars, only those like himself, that this should be discussed. This should never be brought up in public. That's an enormous admission. Well, we're bringing it up in public. And then as you're going to see, the problem is not us. Who are the problem people? Let's see what he says. But what is happening in the last few years is not me anymore. It's the Western academics. These, these problems are now becoming mainstream. Twitter has so many accounts of Quran experts and they're non-Muslims and they're just saying things. There are books written. Yani Brill released a book by Shadi Nasir. Again, yani, uh, read that book as well. Yani, so, uh, for those that are interested in stuff. And you'll understand that, hey, we need ulama who believe in the Quran to defend the Quran. Alhamdulillah. Thumma, alhamdulillah the problem is coming from the Western academics. These problems are becoming mainstream and they're getting into Twitter. And they're getting into all the uh, Facebook and they're also getting onto YouTube. Therefore, it's not, it's something that we cannot talk about. We don't know have an answer. Basically, what he's admitting is he doesn't have an answer. 
He doesn't have an answer. But you're going to hear him say, but if you just if you just take my courses, then you'll, under, then you'll understand it. Basically, as you're going to see, what is his answer? I'd like to know what his answer is. How does he deal with 37 different Qurans, all in Arabic, from 37 different masters and students, or uh, teachers and students, from five different localities around the Arab world, 100 to 200 years after the Quran was supposedly written, 37 of these appear, only once one is chosen, and we're going to even see even that one he's going to have a problem with. But we're going to see, can you understand why he doesn't want to talk about it, why he's never talked about it, why he's never done a, a talk on it. However, if you take my course, then I'll explain it. Isn't that contradictory in and of itself? If you can't explain it to me, and can't explain it to the world, and can't explain it to the non-Muslims, how are you going to explain it to the Muslims? Unless you're going to say, just accept it, like he did when he was at Yale. Just fall back on that same mantra. It is the Word of God. Don't ask me questions. My mind's already made up, or my mind has been made up for me. We're going to see if that's what he comes to. So, let's continue on. Let me ask, ask you one question to try and make this as specific as possible, I think. If I were to give you a blank mushaf, yeah, and, uh, and tell you to write what is munazzal verbatim from Allah into that mushaf with no human interference, would you write something which corresponds? It's with not an easy answer. It's not an easy yes or no. It is enough for the Muslim to believe that the I Quran think this should be an Allah. easy yes or no, though. Yes, and Khadi. I, I have to be Okay, very, very well. So, Ya yeah, Muhammad, after we get off this phone call, me and you, let's have a number of discussions. No problem. I'm very yeah. open with advanced students. But these issues should not... Look, it is Kalamullah, what is going to be written. It is Kalamullah. What, it is what, what, what would you write? Uh, 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 let's you not... Let, let's, you, you're pushing me. And I'm saying it's not hikmah to... Listen, I have a condition. Like I said, everything I say is going to be factual. If I wanted to do yeah. tawdi and whatnot, I would do it right now in front of you. There is no need for tawdiyah. The Quran is the uncreated speech of Allah. The Quran is preserved. The Quran is known. The Quran is mutawatir. And alhamdulillah, all of the qiraat are the Quran. All of the qiraat are authentic. Alhamdulillah. Leave it at that, ya Beyond this, honestly, I have no problem. We'll have a discussion or take my class. But beyond this requires background information. It is enough for the Muslim to know that the Quran is the speech of Allah that has been protected. And what we recite is the kalam of Allah. That is enough for the Muslim <laughs> Jeez. Um, how do you unpack that? Muhammad Hijab has a crisis of faith. Muhammad Hijab wants a direct yes or no an uh, answer. And I can understand sometimes I get that all the time. And there is no yes or no answer. But on this one, on the preservation of the Quran, if I give you a blank piece of paper, will you be able to reproduce? Or what will you be able to reproduce? Which one of these 37? Or the 30, they're officially out now. They're now being published. Which one of these 30? Let's just go with 30. Or even the 3, or the 7, or the 14 that have been traditionally. Which are you going to do? Which one of that are you going to write? And he didn't want to answer that. Did you notice? I refuse to answer that. There are no easy answers. And he says, Muhammad Tijab says, well, it should be easy. Just yes or no. Can it be done? Can you write the Quran exactly like that from the word of God, word of Allah? What did he, how did he respond? Did you notice he went into a mantra? He went back into the narrative. The Quran is the uncreated speech of Allah. The Quran is preserved. The Quran is known. The Quran is mutawatir. That means successive. Uh, it's not. All of the Qur'at and are the Quran. All are authentic. Leave it at that. Just leave it at that. Beyond this requires background information. Take my class. Just take my class. It's almost like a narrative. It's almost like a mantra. It's, almost, it's a formula. Don't question me. Don't ask me this question, Muhammad Hijab. We know that the Quran is the word of God. Don't ask us to prove it. We just know it. This is something we've always been told. Can you imagine having to use that as your excuse? That is the only defense you can come up with in a public context? Is there anything in the Bible that we would say, or is there anything about the preservation of the Bible that we say? We don't ask us that question. If you're not going to, if you don't, if you, I don't have the answers what he is saying. Since when do we have anything like that in the Bible? Have we ever made a claim that we could not prove or that we would not discuss or say, take my class and then you'll understand it? But don't ask me to do this in public and certainly not before the camera. Now he goes on and he says he spent 25 years 
on this. Since he was 21, he's now 46. Yusuke Kadi. I'm going to encapsulate now because we're running out of time. He said, for 25 years I spent my time, and for the last 10 years I have went gone deeply into this. Deeply into this. Wow. So he is, should be a world expert on it. And yet, don't ask me, Muhammad Job, I can't answer you this. Just believe that the Quran is the word of God. So Muhammad had Job asked him a second time. If you wrote a Quran, would it correspond with any rivat or kirat which we have today? Can it be reproducible on a blank piece of paper? His response was, well, it'll probably be a mixture. Not exactly like the Hafs, because that's the one that's been chosen in 1924. It'll be a mixture. Would it be the same as that in the early Medina? He asked that. Now, there was the million-dollar question. He didn't answer that. He put that question out there. Why didn't he answer that? Ooh, doo -doo 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 -doo. That's the question I want to know. What is the Quran that we have today? Or is there a Quran that we have today? Forget about the Kira, even the Ahru. He quickly went off and did not answer that question because that's the million dollar question that no one wants to answer. What is the Quran that actually existed there in the seventh century? What is the Quran that actually existed, existed there Abu, uh, at the time of Abu Bakr or the time of Uthman? Where is the Razm, the skeletal text? That's the real question that was not even discussed. Have you noticed? At the very end, Muhammad Hijaz says this, what you write then down, would it be the verbatim word of God from Allah? And how did Yusuf Qadi answer? The Hadith tell us, it's exactly what the Prophet said. The Hadith tell us so, and if the Hadith tell us this, Hadith written by Al-Buhari in 870, in the late 9th century, 240 years after Muhammad, since the Hadith say so, I accept it. I can't prove it, I can't show you, there's no manuscript, there's nothing that I can take you back to. I just believe it because I've been told it from the time I was yay high to a grasshopper. What a exposition this has been. Yasir Qadi has said a mouthful. I hope you're picking up what's going on from just this 20 minutes that I've gone through. It's much longer, of course, because I'm explaining and unpacking it. What Yasir Qadi admitted there yesterday on the 8th of June is the first time I've heard my, uh, someone of his stature admit that. And what he says, Muslims are going to follow. Muslims are going to be very bothered by that admission. Because no longer can they say, we have one Quran. Because even Yasakadi cannot say that anymore. There is no such thing as one Quran that can be traced all the way back to the time of Ruthman, even more so to the time of Abu Bakr, even more so to the time of Muhammad. What we're not even saying is, what about the reserved Quran that's up on those tablets in heaven? No way we could even prove that. But can you even see, he didn't want to answer this question. This is the most difficult question that any Muslim scholar has to answer. I, can you see, for all my years, 25 years, though I've studied it, last 10 years, I've dived in deeply into it. No Muslim really has an answer to it. The most difficult subject is this subject, Ahruf and Kira. No, it isn't the most difficult subject. This is just one of many. What he said at the very beginning about the Medin in Musaf. Where is that Medin in Musaf? Where is it with money? He has yet to answer that question. That's the one I would like to ask him. But, but God bless him for the fact that he was being honest. He had to because Muhammad Hijab wanted him to, demanded him to. So what is the answer that he comes up with? They're all the Musaf, all 37. Or if you find more in the future, all of them. Because it doesn't matter. These are God's holy word. This is God's word. This is Allah's own word. Don't ask me how I can prove it. Don't ask me how I can understand it. Don't even ask me how I can de really define it. That's not important. Just believe. Take that leap of faith. As long as you believe, and as long as you say it, as long as you say that this is the word of God, this and this has always been preserved, and God says that he promised it in chapter 15, verse 9, that he would preserve his own word, then we have to believe it even when the Western scholars come up and ask us to really start to prove it. We can't prove it, but we can believe it. And that's all you're going to get from Yusuf, uh, Yasir Gadi. I feel sorry for Muhammad Hijab. I don't know how he's going to defend it from here on out. I don't know how mo any Muslim is going to defend it from here on out. I'm so glad I'm not in their shoes. And I'm so glad we don't make this claim about our Bible. Thank goodness we don't make this claim about our Bible. 
Well, that was good to see Yasser Kardi come clean. Let's see if other Muslims will come clean. Let's see if they will now finally admit that this is not the same Quran that was there in Medina. We don't even know if there was a Quran in Medina. That has yet to be answered. That's what we're working on in this whole series. What actually did happen in the 7th century? Don't just keep quoting me what people said in the 8th, 9th, and 10th century. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear what happened in the 7th century. I want that Quran. I want the first Quran. I want the complete Quran. 114 surahs from the time of Muhammad, from the time of Abu Bakr, from the time of Uthman. God bless you. This is Jay. Over and out.